this is an interview for the um, oral history project on the Little Brown Jug Race. This is being done by the Delaware County Historical Society. My name is Richard Levy. I am doing an interview with Jack Hilborn, J-A-C-K-H-I-L-B-O-R-N. We are in the district library. Today is February the 4th. And uh, first, I just want to say thank you very much. Well, for, my pleasure, for being Dick. To do Absolutely. This. It's a wonderful project you're doing, and I'm just glad to be a part of it and to participate a little bit. I thank you. Um, uh, so, we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, okay. When you first attended the Little Brown Jug, you were about how old, and uh, what year was that? I was uh, a. Uh, a student at Delaware Hayes High School, if I can recall, when my first judge way back in the 60s, mid-60s, and uh, I can remember, I think it was my first jug, but maybe it wasn't, the jug of 65 when Brett Hanover won the Little Brown Jug, and they, uh, it rained so hard in the morning, we all thought that the race would have to be called off, and you've heard about this, I'm sure. and. Uh, the track road graders came in and took two to three feet of mud off the track, just scraped it to the side, and it was all piled up. Well, then the sun came out at about oh, 11, 11.30 or something like that, and they put sand on the track, and it became raceable. And uh, Brett Hanover set a then world record, I think, of a minute, 57 seconds then. It was the greatest jug I've ever seen and I'll never forget it but it's kind of etched in my mind I would have been probably in 65 I would have been 16 years old okay. what impressions did you have about the event in general well the little brown jug is a great event I can remember when uh, I uh, worked after college uh, even when I was in college I came back every year to the jug um, and after college when I worked in Cincinnati I would take a day of vacation and come up to the jug and I can't remember if my wife Mary came up with me at that time we were married in Cincinnati in 73 but anyway um, the impression is that it's it's a great it's a great spectacle I mean you know there are few spectacles in this community where you get 50,000 people. Maybe it's the only one, probably. You get 50, 40, 50,000 people at one time coming into town for, a, for an afternoon of, of harness racing. It's a big deal. And people that haven't experienced it, and I've talked to so many people over the years that have never heard of the Little Brown Jug or whatever, and uh, they, they know uh, thoroughbred racing because of the Kentucky Derby, but they don't necessarily know harness racing and with the sulky and so forth behind it. And so um, when they hear about the Little Brown Jug, they're, you know, very impressed and very interested and so forth. But uh, it's just a real spectacle. You have to experience it to, to understand it. Yeah. Indeed. So your first jug was somewhere in the mid-1960s. It was. And have you been a regular attender? I have. I have not. I don't believe I've missed a, maybe I've missed a jug in the last 60 years, 50-some years, but I doubt it. And uh, uh, I know in the last 40 years I have not missed one. Um, and uh, I can remember I got tickets in 78. We have, I still have those same seats. They're four front row seats uh, from the then fair secretary, Bill Deal, that my dad knew and I met in 78 after I came back to Delaware. And uh, uh, dad said, well, he called up Bill Deal one time and Bill, he said, uh, do you have any seats for the little brown jug for my son, Jack, and his wife? And Bill said, well, you come on down next day or two. He says, let me see what I can do. Well, he had these four seats that are right out in front of the grandstand on the chair platform. They're chair, what they call chair platform seats. They're right along the rail. 
right about 20 yards down from the finish line. They're wonderful seats and I, I don't want to uh, give them up for anything and so we've taken many friends and, and business associates over the years and, and still do that. So, okay. yep. So it's a long tradition for you and it I, is. I'm wondering if in a sense there are pastimes or rituals or things that, you know, when it's jug day, this is what we do. It is. We, uh, particularly with friends that come and go with us, whether family members or friends, we, uh, we always, uh, Mary and I always, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the day's events is that we take our other car up to park it at one of the private yard parking lots there off the fairgrounds, just south of the fairgrounds on Chestnut Street. And I usually take it up about 8.30, 9 o'clock in the morning, and there's nobody there, or we're one of the first cars there. And uh, uh, then, um, uh, then we go up to the races. And uh, we, we live just west of the hospital, and my wife comes up usually a little later. I usually get up since post time has been uh, moved up to 11 o'clock. I usually get up there a little before noon and then spend the whole afternoon and she usually gets up by one o'clock something like that she'll she'll walk up to the race but but it's sort of a um, it's a tradition that that we just it's sort of ingrained in in yeah. our and what we're going to do that day right. you know e even to where you park the car in the morning. even to where we park the car we've been to the same parking spot for years <laughs> same parking spot for years mm -hmm. and right on chestnut street uh just off the fairground, just south of the fairgrounds there. Okay. Yep. So in this history of, of going to the jug, I'm assuming you have seen changes. Uh, yeah. Have, have, and I, I don't know whether you could comment on either changes for the better or changes for the worse over the Well, the one big change that I have noticed, Dick, is in, frankly, attendance, because attendance actually at the race has waned. We used to get over 50,000 people. Now we're lucky to get in the early 40s or by 40,000. Um, so we've lost maybe 10,000 people, but that's a good thing because I say it's a good thing because it's the simultaneous betting at other tracks has, I think, cut into the fact that uh, people don't have to come to the race to bet on the jug. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I know that the jug people are very happy with that because the coffers have been increased over the years. But attendance has, uh, you know, for example, this past year, I think in 2019, they had what, 40, 41,000, 40, okay, 51,000, 50, wow. I don't know, but anyway, they had, uh, uh, they had, uh, you know, 40-some thousand people, and, and at least that was the announced attendance by Roger Houston, who's the announcer. And uh, I thought, gee, you know, this has played a part, is the simultaneous sure. betting. Sure. So that's a major change that I have seen simply as a spectator. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I can relate to you some stories that I've had over the years of experiences that I've had at the Little Brown Jug, if, if you would want. Uh, that's why we're here. I can remember when I was in high school years ago, back in the 60s, I was president of a organization at the high school called the Key Club, which is part of the Kiwanis organization. It's a, it's a high school service organization. Well, I was president, and one of our chief fundraisers was to seat people in the grandstands. And uh, so as president, I got the, uh, obviously I got the top choice of where I wanted to be and that sort of thing that day. So I had elected to uh, watch people and seat people in the area where they go underneath out on the track and go across the track to the infield stand where the winners do and that sort of thing. And uh, so there are seats up, up on each side of that sort of uh, tunnel way there, and, and uh, 
So one day I was standing there and I had a soft drink in my hand and this guy and his wife came and he said, he said, son, do you want something in that? Here's a high school kid who wasn't used to alcohol and that sort of thing. I said, well, sure, I'll take it. So, boy, he loaded that thing up. I don't know what it was, Jim Beam or whatever it was, but bourbon, some sort of bourbon whiskey in that Coke. And, and so I was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> another thing, another th I can remember, the, in 66, I remember, uh, the horse that won that year was a horse called Best of All, I think, and Howard something, his last name from Cincinnati, I remember, he owned that horse. And I happened to seat he and his family up in the grandstand. And uh, so after his horse won the jug, he was handing out tips to everybody. He gave me a $50 tip. In those days, in the 60s, $50, I mean, it's still big money, but it's, it's real big money then. And I thought, man, I'm, I'm the king of the world, you know, and I'll never forget that. And... Uh, Howard Bisinger, maybe is his name. I, I can't remember, but he owned the horse best of all that won the jug that year. And this was before he and his family went down and went across where I was the previous year, uh -huh. uh, standing. And uh, so, anyway, th those are those are a couple of great great yeah. memories that I have. Another memory I've got is. Um, these are the days years ago when people could bring their own alcohol into the grandstand area. And uh, I remember because I used to, on jug mornings, I used to sell tickets at the gate for Kiwanis from 7 to 11, then I'd go home and change and then come up to the races. That's when the start time would be eh, 12, 1 o'clock, something like that. and. Uh, I used to watch people come into the fairgrounds with two wheel dollies with nothing but beer, beer loaded up with beer. So I knew that they were up to get a good drunk that day. Well, anyway, Mary and I were, this was years ago, and we ha had our front row seats while the jug was over, and we were walking on out the fairgrounds on the east side down over to the Liberty Gate. And these two guys that were drunker than a skunk were about 20 yards in front of us. And Mary and I were just watching them and, and uh, we were laughing because they were swaying back and forth. They were just having a good time. And one guy passed out. He just went straight down, face down on that gravel uh, drive through. And his partner goes, well, gee, you know, what are you doing down there? You know, he was drunk and a skunk. And he pulls the guy on his feet face first oh. over the gravel and into the grass on the side. And I'm thinking, oh. And uh, so we walked on, but I still remember that. <laughs> and <laughs> those two, two guys, drunk and a skunk, but they were just happy. And the one guy passed out. And then he... Uh, he probably woke up and he had scratch marks probably all over his face and wondering what's going on. But his partner wanted to get him off the road so he wouldn't get hit by a car. Well, and, could have been worse. Could have, could have been worse. Could have been worse. But uh, pulled him face first, I remember. And, uh, oh, gosh, the memories we've got. Then I can remember also back in, I think it was the late 70s, when they had the bad accident oh. at the Little Brown Jug, which you've probably heard about, where the starting gate didn't close and uh, didn't close properly. Well, we were sitting in our seats there and the it passed and, and of course I'm watching the start of the race and I didn't look to my right. Well here all this this gate didn't close and picked off people as they were standing in front there and and uh, I can still remember they stopped the race just like that. And Roger Houston, the announcer, said, uh, if there are any doctors in the stands, we need you now. And uh, so some doctors got out of the stands and they were running over to, to where they are. And, and I can remember they, they stopped the race. And eventually they started the races again. But um, 
I believe it was uh, John Campbell, who was probably the winningest driver of all time in the Little Brown Jug, was maybe involved in some way, shape, or form in, in the crash that, in, in the horses. There was a horse on the track, uh, the gate, you know, or maybe that was a different time. I'm, I'm, I'm getting maybe mixed up, but the, the starting gate did not close. And uh, uh, so I can remember there was some repercussions from that and, and, uh, and so forth, but people were hurt, and uh, yeah, it, it was, it was, a, it was a changed day. the atmosphere the whole day. Everything mm -hmm. was a downer after that. Yeah, yep. sure. Yep. Okay. Um, again, you've seen lots of races. I don't know whether there are certain ones that immediately come to mind because they were really surprising, or they were really exciting, or really something. Well, I yeah. think one. Uh, one that, that I remember, of course, is the Brett Hanover, Hanover race uh, in 65 when he won on the then what would have been a sloppy track but turned out to be a wonderful track because the sun had come out and dried the track and they put sand over it. And, but they had taken literally two to three feet of the road graders. And I can remember sitting in the stands waiting for the road graders to get done, and I'm thinking, gee, man, they're never going to race this, never going to be able to, but they did. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful thing. So I remember that race in particular. And, of course, I remember, the, uh, as I had mentioned previously, in 1966, best of all, the, the winner there. There have been some other races. Uh, uh, the fastest race uh, was uh, uh, it wasn't in a, it was in the Jug Day, but you know there are other races that they race other than Jug Day, and this was an aged pacing classic, and a horse by the name of Jet Log. It was a gray horse, and he set the all-time track record at that time. I don't know if it still held up. 148, something like that. I mean, you know, he just flew around that track. And I can remember Roger Houston, the voice of the jug. Um, you know, it's, it, it, when I get up there and I hear Roger Houston and his voice, you know you're someplace special. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, you, you said it's someplace special. I, what do you think makes the jug special? Well, it's raced on a Thursday. That is part of the tradition that I don't think will ever change. It is the tradition, part of the tradition, part of the lore of the jug is the fact that it, it's raced at a county fair circuit. It's a big time race that, and that's why the drivers, at least most of them that I've heard of, love to come to the jug because it's a throwback to way the way racing was 50, 100 years ago at, Del at county fairs and so on. This is raced at the Delaware County Fair. So there's a lot of tradition there. It's always raced on the third Thursday of September. Uh, there have been, uh, I know, movements afoot to try to get the, horse, the race to change to a weekend, to a bigger track. And it just isn't going to change. It just isn't going to change. That's part of the, the tradition there that I think and part of the lore of the jug is the tradition and mm -hmm. that's, that's been since 46. Uh, Curly Smart won that first jug and I remember meeting Curly Smart in, in mm -hmm. our office uh, years ago in the early 70s. Uh, he, Curly was still still alive and he came in he was really he just talking machine and every other word was a swear word but he was a great guy great great man great man curly smart he was the driver of the first winner of the jug sure and the track superintendent and that's right yeah. that's right yeah ensign hanover i think was his uh, horses yes. yeah. uh, that won the first jug yeah speaking of old timers um did you have much in the way of contact with um with Mr. Thompson, Hank, or I, I knew Hank Thompson. I would say hello to Mr. Thompson at the post office uh, every day, uh, just about every day when I went over there. I would see Hank and and uh, 
I, I would talk to him briefly, uh, uh, but uh, I never knew Joe Neville. I never knew, uh, but I knew Hank Thompson. Mm -hmm. And I, the, the uh, drivers, I've never known any of the drivers, John Campbell or any of them, but uh, Stanley Dancer or any of the great drivers. Uh, uh, but uh, other than Curly Smart, of course, and Curly was from Delaware, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you look into the future, um, what changes, if any? You, you said that there are some traditions that absolutely shouldn't be yeah. changed. It shouldn't be on a day other than Thursday. It, 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 it's got to be part of the county fair. Are there changes that you see that might be necessary, if, if any, in order for this to prosper and continue into the future? Well, that's a good question and uh, one that I really haven't given a lot of thought to, Dick, uh, as far as what changes might be in the future uh, to help the race, uh, you know, They've, they've, I mentioned before the off-track betting that has uh, hurt, I think, attendance a little bit. Um, but the money take, I know, is, is tremendously more. Um, so generally the, the people that are in charge of the race are pretty happy, I think, with that. Um, I can't really think of anything because you don't want to change too much of the tradition. The tradition of the county fair, the tradition of having the uh, track there, Raleigh McNamara built that track. Uh, I knew Mr. McNamara, I knew his grandson, I know his grandson real well. His gran I grew up with his grandson and I can remember going out to the McNamara home out in Berlin, uh, on Berlin Station Road out south uh, southeast of town back in the day um, to spend a day uh, with uh, at the uh, McNamara farm out there and uh, Rollin K McNamara but anyway uh, I don't want to digress too much but um, really can't see anything I can't think of really any changes major changes that I would make in the race okay. yeah let me head back to Mr. McNamara because you're the first person who said, you know, I yeah. knew Mr. McNamara. So, what were your impressions of him? He was well, considerably older. I was, than you were young. I was very young. I was probably seven, eight, nine years old. And uh, his grandson, Mac Michael, who grew up on Elmwood Drive, Mac lives in town. Mac is a retired dentist. Um, and uh, he's a big theatrical guy, uh, but his grandfather was, his name is Rollin K. McNamara Michael, and uh, name for his grandfather, Rollin K. McNamara. Well, I knew Mr. McNamara, I knew their, uh, it's sort of, their farm was sort of out by the New Berlin School, Olentangy School, sort of out uh, that way, and uh, uh, I can still remember uh, going out there for a day with Mac and his mother. She had an old Ford convertible, I remember, and we, on a summer, summer day, we would go out to the McNamara farm, and it was pretty nice. I mean, really ritzy. And, uh, uh, but he, Mr. McNamara was a county commissioner, and he built that track in the 1930s. Yeah. Built that track. And, uh, that's what he did. And what we've heard is that the design of that track, because it has such long curves and relatively short straightaways, makes it one of the fastest in the world. Yeah, probably and is. So it is the fastest half mile track in the world. There have been more, I think Roger Houston would back this up and Jay Wolf, there have been more world records set on that track than any other track in the world, uh, half mile track in the world. and. Uh, so I think what you're saying is exactly yeah. correct, Dick. Do you have any impressions of what Raleigh McNamara was like? Um, he was a man of, of integrity. He was uh, kind of gruff, but you know, with a grandparent, obviously he, uh, and I'm a grandparent now, you love your grandkids and you dote over them and so forth. And he was, he was like that with Mac, I remember that. And, uh, but, uh, I don't really have 
too many impressions other than I think he was a man of integrity that I knew of, of course, as a young young lad, and you don't know a whole lot of, sure. you know, but uh, I do remember going out to the McNamara farm. Yep. Okay. Um, this is a tough question. Um, I, I'd like you to imagine that Delaware no longer had the little brown jug. Uh -huh. um, what impact would that have on you personally? What impact do you think it would have on the residents of this county? I think the impact, uh, the brown jug is, it would impact me personally because obviously my wife and I wouldn't go there. We wouldn't, you know, it's been a tradition for years and years and years of going up to the, the jug races. Um, I know it's, it provides a tremendous impact on our local economy because you don't get 40,000 people in and a lot of people stay overnight, they eat dinner and so forth after the race or before the races and so forth. They, they shop downtown. I think there's a major economic hit that could be to the community. Um, now I say that Delaware does not have a lot of overnight accommodations and a lot of people will have to go down who, who come here from way out of town, I'm thinking from Canada or, or farther, um, they may have to stay down in Worthington or Polaris or, mm -hmm. or up in Marion or someplace and, or out on 71 and come into town because um, we just don't have the, the overnight motels here in Delaware for a town this size to accommodate the jug. But on the other hand, um, I think it would be a tremendous, if, if the uh, race was not not a part of Delaware anymore, I mean that's, that's what helps put Delaware, I've often called Delaware, Delaware is known for maybe three things, uh, four things now, but uh, I think uh, Bun's Restaurant, Ohio Wesleyan University, and the Little Brown Jug. And maybe not so much the fact that it was the birthplace of a president of the United States, which I think has become more and more. Plus, we have the Arts Castle, which is an institution uh, in and of itself, I think, that has helped to, to put Delaware on the map. But for years, it was the big three. It was Bun's Restaurant, Little Brown Jug, and Ohio Wesleyan University. And uh, you take one of those out and, yeah. you know, it could have some dire, dire effects, I think. Enough. Are there any other stories, any other remembrances that you would like to tell us that you think? Well, I add? think the only other remembrance, Dick, might be the fact that uh, uh, my mother was killed in an automobile accident in 1957, and after she was deceased, uh, my grandparents, who he was a retired medical physician for 50 years over in Pittsburgh, he retired to Delaware. My grandparents came out and moved at a house across the street from the fairgrounds on Pennsylvania Avenue, 257 Pennsylvania. And uh, I remember that my grandparents and my two aunts that lived with my grandparents, two great aunts, loved the horse racing, they loved the little brown jug, and they would, they would go tie their chairs up to the fence, as many people did <coughs> in those days, and uh, and uh, uh, then they they'd have a chair for the for the race. They would sit on the the, the start of the home stretch, the curve, mm -hmm. the home stretch, and that's where they would put their chairs, and they would you know. They would just bet among themselves, but they had a great day. And I still have fond memories of that back in the 60s. Uh, and then my grandparents finally uh, both died in the mid-60s. And, and, uh, but uh, I have great memories of that. Yeah. 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 OK. Last question. Um, are there people who you think we need to interview? Because if we didn't, it would represent a pretty big hole in this history? Well, obviously, I'm sure you've interviewed maybe the Thompson boys, Chip and T, 
uh, Jay Wolf, who uh, Roger Houston. Um, I mentioned them before. Uh, they've been there, a chairman of the Little Brown Jug Society. Maybe. Uh, um, um, some other members of the Little Brown Jug Society, local members. Uh, some of them are deceased now that I, I knew them. You know, I'm thinking of uh, John Brown, Frank Welker, some others that are now deceased. But um, there are still some. Tom Wright is one. Um, those are some people I can think of, yeah. Okay. You know, when we started this whole process, one of the things that came to mind, we were meeting at the log cabin. Oh, yeah. We were looking at the Wall of Fame and all the pictures. And it was Jay Wright who said, it's too bad we don't have the stories from him, the stories from him, and so on. And so the point of this is to capture the stories now, right? Oh, okay, yeah. And uh, so I'm... I'm Delighted that a person who has goodness fifty plus years of of jug memories was uh, willing to be interviewed. So thank well, you. Well, sure. Very much. Well, thank you, Dick, for the opportunity. I appreciate it, and uh, uh, I, we just love going up to the Little Brown Jug. We love the day of racing, and it's a long day. But it, uh, and maybe we complain that you know we get sun beating down on us too hard on a hot day or maybe it's too cold but it's a wonderful day and yeah. and we uh, we invite friends or colleagues or relatives up and uh, for example this past fall uh, our Mary's uh, my wife's uh, sister-in-law or sister and her husband came up from Cincinnati and joined us for the races and uh, I think next year maybe my brother and his wife will come over from Westerville and and uh, join us, and uh, so it, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot okay. of fun. We have a we have a great time and great great memories, and and uh, but I can remember uh, we had some friends. I've been active in the Qantas organization for years, and and we uh, we had some friends that came down from Cleveland to join us at the races one day. And after the races were over, which is like 6.30, something like that, starting to, you know, the shadows are starting to come in. But the gal, uh, she didn't want to leave. And, uh, you know, I said, well, we need to get downtown to get something to eat and beat the crowd and beat everybody out and so forth. And so we went ahead and left but she didn't want to leave but we got my point is we got out of there real late and there is such a crowd of people at the winter circle following the jug and and roger Houston was interviewing everybody and so forth and it was just a wonderful experience and i'm thinking my gosh on a beautiful september late september late summer early fall day <clears throat> It doesn't get any better than this in yeah. Delaware, Ohio, little Delaware, Ohio. And I looked at the sky and looked out the crowds and so forth, and it was it was just really, really kind of cool. But I'll never forget that. And uh, yep. Well, thank, thank you, you for much. the opportunity, Dick. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank okay. you so much. Sure.